All right, so we're recording and we'll go on Facebook. Yeah, we're recording. And I'm going to turn it live now. Hi, Rochelle. How are you today? Hi, Sarah. I'm great. Awesome. So I've just turned this webinar on live and I'm just getting us set up so we can uh, broadcast it onto Facebook. Get that going. And I think what we're going to do is get to know you a little bit while I get everything set up here. Okay. And we will let um, everybody join in. So today, Mich Rochelle, I said Michelle. Okay. So here we go. Happens a lot. <laughs> Happens a lot. So today I'm being joined by Rochelle from Sitzen House. Sitzen House. <laughs> and it's time to Mr. I know. And it's not great if you're like me and you read too fast and then you say names wrong. Like I said earlier when we were getting set up, I called you citizen. So um, sits in Wouldn't house. The first time. <laughs> and today we're talking all about upholstery. We're gonna be learning about how to be the most profitable with it when working with a workroom and some different options. We are going to look at how to know what is quality, which I'm especially interested in learning about. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure we're gonna have a whole bunch of questions from the people that are joining live today with us. So I hope so. And you guys just if, if you're watching, no question is too simple or stupid. Please throw it out there because I know that they've cut courses in the schools. So don't feel scared about asking something. I can tell you from experience when I did my design degree, we didn't even touch upholstery, textiles at all. Right. right. We, didn't even, we didn't even look at it. All that mattered was building code. That was it. Well, so I am like especially interested in learning all about this. Um, so for everybody watching right now, the, you can absolutely uh, type your questions um, using the Q&A box. You'll see that. Um, you can also um, introduce yourselves. Let us know where you're watching from. Say hello. Like Rochelle said, no question is dumb. Please bring on the questions. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rochelle to do a little bit more of an introduction. And mm -hmm. then she'll jump into a presentation. All right. Well, gosh, trying to give an intro about myself is, you know, this is a little bit of a challenge, but um, I've been in the design industry in, in varying roles for about 20, 25 years. Um, I started off, you know, as a kid, I always loved seeing how things were put together and I was <laughs> forced to do sewing lessons instead of going roller skating with my friends. So, as much as I hated that at the time, it's really built up my skill set to what I understand now. Um, I went off to college and I started off in the architecture program, which I loved, but um, you know, elementary applied mathematics, which is calculus on steroids, kind of trips me up. And um, I ended up marrying an architect <laughs> and then uh, settling here in Kansas City and just started flipping our home, doing pretty much all of the work on my own. Um, from there, the neighbors really liked what I was doing and wanted to hire me. So I kind of started being, you know, that, that neighbor with great flair. Um, and uh, then I started building and making drapes in my basement. Then I worked for a drapery workroom for a while, and just by happenstance, I fell into a show house because the designer that had hired me to work uh, flaked out and left the project. So they asked me, well, can you finish it? I said, okay, yeah, sure, I can finish it. And then from there, that's how I decided to get official, make it all happen, um, did consulting design work, and then always, I've always loved vintage upholstery and I've really always seen the value in it and um, just really wanted my own workroom. So I, I've had my own upholstery workroom for six years. Uh, it is now closed because um, people have retired and my mom is retired and so my focus right now is education and that has evolved because having been in this really great design community that we're in, um, I'm realizing you guys, we, you didn't learn this stuff and no fault of you, no fault of anybody. I think they're really trying to push the retail. So we're leaving money on the table and we're not offering the great value that we could to our clients by either sourcing vintage, which is a huge unknown, 
or even trade. And that's what we're going to talk about in, in the cost analysis in this webinar, as well as some workroom etiquette, how to have a great win-win relationship with your trades. I am so excited to dive into this one. I am a huge vintage lover, but I don't know what quality is. Truthfully, I'm like, that looks pretty cool. And, but right. it could be total garbage. And I don't really know just because it's from the 60s or 50s or, you know, it's kind of my well, mystery, right? So I will say as a general rule, because this is probably the most popular question that, that we got in the upholstery workroom was, um, and it was a design and, and to the public uh, a reupholstery studio is, is, is it worth it? And hands down, I'm going to say 90 plus percent of the time, if it was built over, built older than 1985, then definitely it's going to be a better product than what is even on the shelves today. And the reason for that is basically our wood sourcing. And, and when we started really getting into the business of importing and exporting, because prior to about 85, that's when our um, furniture industry really kind of changed and, and went in another direction and our wood sourcing. I never knew that. So yeah. yeah, I'm excited. Little little fact. So you if mean, it's older than 85. Okay. It's I'm going to keep, sure keep that in back of my mind. In mind. Um, all right, Rochelle, we have just one quick question here. Sure. Um, Sonia says, hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I am a current student of Rochelle's course, and I'm learning more in her course than I did in my design college courses by far. I can't say enough oh. good things about what I'm learning. Not a question, but a wonderful comment. Thank you, Sonia. I appreciate that. That's so sweet of you. Thank you. That's wonderful. So I think with that, why don't we hop into your presentation? Yes. Okay, let's do it. So I, this is, okay, guys, forgive me. I'm tech challenged. I know a lot about fabric and upholstery, but tech, is this where I hit screen share? Yeah, at the bottom, you press screen share. Oh, got it. It'll just take a minute and it'll come right. up. You'll, oh, that's you'll, a nice frozen face. I love when that happens. <laughs> And it never catches you on a good. Okay, it's it's hey, coming. Woo! Squirt. Yep. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> That's good. Um, if anybody can't hear us or see the presentation, just message in the chat and let us know. Great. Otherwise, um, take it away, Rochelle. Okay. So what I want you all to see is the is this sofa that that is here. Okay. Yes, it has arm covers. That's what the client wanted, uh, specifically because it's white. Um, this is a vintage Henredon piece, okay, and what is really amazing about this vintage Henredon piece is that um, this was part of a roadkill collection that I'd had. It came to me, the frame was free, and uh, the client would pick a, pick a piece, which I'm, I teach you how to source vintage pieces also, but the really crazy thing about this was that the price to reupholster this including her labor with my markup and retail source retail price for the fabric was about half of what Henry Dong currently sells this same frame for using a COM fabric. So just bear that in mind. Um, sometimes you can see some interesting things and, and, and a classic shape rolled arm. This is a tuxedo sofa. It has uh, spring down cushions. Um, the client wanted foam back for this because it was more supportive than a, than a down back. But just kind of bear that, that photo there in mind. Okay, now how do I scroll? Alrighty. Let's try. There we go. Whoop. Come on. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Okay, so here's what we're going to be going over today. And um, we're going to talk about how to earn higher profit project profits by sourcing vintage reupholstery or trade over retail. So retail is super, super easy. It's a point and click and that's what a lot of, a lot of designers are trained to do. And in fact, I think some of these um, big box stores are kind of lobbying our designers to, to, they're introducing themselves, they're making themselves known and, and making themselves the easy, easy out to just point and click. Um, you can bring value to your clients by offering the best quality upholstery. What to look for in a well-built quality upholstery. That is really what my 101 um, course talks about. And workroom etiquette, basic workroom etiquette, how to work with um, trades because they are a different breed. And we'll talk about that later. Um, and then how a work order differs from a purchase order. 
a work order is much more intense than a pur purchase order. And a work order is what ensures that the piece that you order is what you're going to get. So this first page that I have here is um, the price breakdown of reupholstery versus trade. So I did some, some hunting online and found um, what amounted to um, just a track arm, 86 inch sofa, um, standard cushions, you know, a, a well built, something that says that it has those hallmarks of quality that we all kind of logically have heard about, which we'll go over here shortly, but all of those earmarks and hallmarks of quality. And I've price differentiated this from re, reupholstery versus a trade piece. Now the trade piece pricing that I used was for Lee Industries because that's an easy, easy accessible. On the next page, we're gonna go over the price difference between reupholstery versus a retail. And I used a restoration hardware piece as a, as a breakdown for that. And then on the page following that, we're gonna see exactly what that profit margin difference looks like. So labor, your labor working with a workroom is going to, to be, um, it's gonna vary a bit depending on your location and depending on what level of um, detail you have done with your piece. So by level of detail, that, that might be construction and, and frame repairs. If you have a frame that needs to be, um, you know, reblocked and glued, that would probably increase your labor price. And um, you would know that going into it based on what the frame feels like. Um, this labor price is based for the Midwest, Kansas City area, and this would be a complete and total tear down, meaning you're gonna strip the baby all the way down to the wood frame. The fabric, and these are, see how I have net cost? Um, the fabric is 12 yards for this sofa at $50 net. That means that the client is, it's $100 retail price. Um, most of the fabric that I sold that is durable enough that it's gonna last as long as your upholstery job, which my expectation is about 20 years, I'm looking at a good quality sofa should last in its current upholstery job for about 20 years. So just to kind of level the playing field for all three of these pieces that we're looking at. Your delivery? Usually, if you're working with a workroom, it's free. It's included. So net cost to your designer is about $1,600. Take that same rolled arm, 86 inch, three cushion sofa, and if we're going to, to the trade, source it, we're looking at about $3,500 MSRP. And I can't see what I have underneath there, but I think I have 21. So um, designer trade pricing is, is you get a 40% split on working with Lee as a designer pricing, unless you're a stockist. So um, very few of us have the ability to be stockists and you, you're always going to get a better price when you do have the ability to do that. But for most people, most designers buy on designer rates, which is a 40% discount. You're going to pay shipping. You're going to pay resale receiving and then you're going to pay delivery these are all based on my kansas city my receiver price so the net cost for essentially the same piece is 24.63 okay and um let's see you may or may not now i've added all of those costs in there because you may or may not pass those costs on to your client that's all dependent on how you run your own personal business model okay so reupholstery same thing versus the retail. Okay, so I did find it was actually a more expensive sofa than 3,500. I just rounded it off. Restoration Hardware has this membership program. So the membership cost, if you want to be part of their special trade program, it's $100. And then you get another 20% um, off of that. So the 20, what do I have here? I can't see what that number is. Whatever that number is that's living underneath the screen right here, that is what the cost is. Plus delivery is $199. So net cost, apples to apples, $1,600 versus $2916. Now let's see how that plays in the graph. We doing okay, Sarah? 
Yes, absolutely. Sorry. I okay. muted my, I mute myself because that way there's just like no background noise that comes No, no, up. that's okay. Just want to um, make sure so I'm still making sense here. Okay, 100%. So you, you can move your little face too. If it's ever covering the numbers, that's what I was going uh -huh. to You can drag Yeah, I don't know how to do that. That's okay. Don't worry about it. If you, if uh, if I have you to do it you, again, you can, you can let me know, but um, yeah. I think we're okay at the moment. Okay, okay. so that $3,500 line, that is what your client is expecting that they're going to pay for a quality sofa. Now, there's a lot of other things that we can talk about, um, and, and we talk about these in, in my group in the house, and then we talk about these also in, in the course, but $3,500 is about the sweet spot for your better, you know, something that's going to last a bit. And what kind of budget, living room budget, does that translate to? That translates to about a 20-ish, 20 to 30-ish thousand dollar living room redo, not including design fees. Okay, so when you're looking at, well, how do I decide how much to spend for a client? Well, a sweet spot for that is about 20,000 to 30,000 dollars for your living room redo. And that, in my mind, typically includes a sofa, a pair of chairs, an ottoman, a couple of end tables, some lamps, a rug, da 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 da. Um, so $3,500. So you can see in this line how much potential there is for markup availability. If you have a client that you really just feel like they need to have this quality piece, you can work within um, and, and alter your, your budget, your, your methods for um, giving clients a, a discount or, or however you want to work with them. I mean, that, I'm not in here to tell anybody how to run their business other than to say and show you what your potential profit margin is. Um, you know, some people I've gone to the, to the way that I've raised my hourly rates and um, people pay me now mainly more for what's in my brain as, to, as opposed to you know, what I can source. Um, but I don't offer a straight pass through, but they do get at about $15,000 project. They do get to share my discounts. So, that's a whole other topic for another another discussion, but you can see right here how much opportunity there is for making a project work for your client. Now, if you're just saying, okay, go to Restoration Hardware, buy this piece, there's not a lot of wiggle room in there, none, very little. So um, what that, I also did some markup Amount. Okay, so if you are sourcing reupholstery and you want to level it, net cost versus the MSRP, you're getting a 54% margin on that. That's a, almost a $1,900 profit. If you're use, going with the trade route, that's a 30% margin, which is about a 1055 profit. With retail, you're getting a 17% margin and you're making about $600 profit. So hopefully, you can see that either trade or establishing a, a relationship with a upholstery workroom is the way to really increase your project profits by between 20 to 30%. Does that make sense? That makes, I'm here, that makes okay. perfect sense. Well, this would be an, a perfect opportunity to, to see, let me scroll down and make sure, see what the next thing is. Okay, this would be, let me leave this back up here. This would be the perfect opportunity to take any questions. I have one question that's come in. Um, okay. okay, so when we're talking about a designer's time, mm -hmm. um, how, what is the level of, involvement or the time that the designer would be expected to spend when they're um, say sourcing doing a reupholstery versus trade versus retail right is one so much easier than the other that it would ever justify making such a small profit margin i'm not okay. suggesting it is i'm wondering because on oh, wait, wait. can you re a small yeah. profit margin meaning to work with with like a retail source yeah that's my question to you so um, the only time I have ever found it to be profitable, profitable, and only by profitable, I mean by covering my butt. Because if I have a really lower end entry level design project that 
frankly, they just can't afford the quality. And, and we talk about, and I educate them, okay, this is something you are only going to have for two to two to five years. Go into it, expect it. I appreciate you want a nice looking space, um, but if you can get the inexpensive stuff and and just know it's only going to last you two years, and during that two years you save. I'm going to say here, you're going to pay my design fee. You go, you buy this thing, and I'm out. So that means that the warranty is there. They have to deal with the headaches. That way, I'm, I'm just stepping myself on backwards out because, quite frankly, $600 is not worth the time, the headache, the effort, trying to deal with another salesperson who's probably going to try to upsell my client. Oh, by the way, you're here. Look at this great lamp. Why don't we just get everything while you're here? And then they've, you know... In that kind of instance, you are better off leaving your sofa for last. Leave your upholstery for last because then they're already locked into everything else. Everything else. So it's really, there's, you're not, I, that's kind of what I was leaning towards, but there isn't much <laughs> benefit. Like yeah, going reupholstery or trade because you can make the most amount yes. of it. And I'm going to say something that is going to floor you here. Absolutely okay. floor you. If I have a client that is super entry level budget, and they need all the stuff, um, I, I really do recommend Ikea, believe it or not. Of all the crap upholstery out there, that's gonna be the best crap upholstery. The best crap upholstery. That is the best way of putting it. Um, <laughs> only, because it had, only because it's extremely transparent, it does have a 10 year warranty, which you're not gonna get from anywhere on Wayfair. Um, you have lots of like slip covers, so you can hop online and say you get the Ektorp, which if we're going to apples to apples here with the same shape of sofa that we're talking about with all of these others, rolled arm, 86 inches, three cushions, you are going to spend about $600 for an Ektorp sofa. Is it going to last you more than three years? Probably not, but you're going into it. And, and instead of spending $1,500, which that seems to be a, 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 the sweet spot for low budget upholstery is like $1,500 for, for cheap ones. Um, I would rather see my clients take that slice of the pie, which is what, another $900? Don't make me do math, math, but $900 and either save it or spend it on on a better rug or a better piece of art or you know something but um, just sock it away for future you know furnish forward that is my big mantra and that came from Sheila Bridges uh, so I can't claim that tagline is my own but I, I it resonates with me furnish forward have a plan the best you can and step forward. It's a goal. It's a long-term goal. So the thing is we're going to have a sofa in our life for about 50 years of our lifespan. How many sofas are you going to have? If you get a well-built vintage one, your cost per wearing, so you know like ladies we get a great pair of shoes or a, or a nice coat, great handbag, your cost per wearing goes down over the long haul as opposed to continuing to buy like these Pottery Barn pieces, which they have about a seven year lifespan and you're gonna keep buying them and you're gonna keep buying them. And That makes perfect sense. I love that. Fashion Does forward, it? yeah. And um, just the, when you put it in perspective that way and you think about buying the low end and having to do it every seven years, like even if you stretched it and it was a disgusting sofa and you made it 10 years, you're still going to be buying a couple of them. So uh -huh. why not invest in good quality, have it reupholstered and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of those, uh, what we do in, in um, I have the video, it's in the 101 and, and some of you may have seen it um, on my Facebook live. I have dissected the Pottery Barn sofa and a lot of those big box pieces, including restoration, including some of those, they're, they're made with plywood. Uh, you can't easily reupholster plywood. You have to increase your labor on that. If you have a 10 year old piece and someone says, okay, well, I just want to reupholster my, my PB Comfort sofa. 
you have to add framework to it because you can't staple into the laminated layers of plywood. So that increases your, your price point. And then they're going, oh, well, how many yards of fabric do I need for this? How much is the labor for that? Well, gosh, golly, I only paid this much for it. And so that's when it's like, is it worth it? Is it not worth it? So it's, it's kind of a, you're stuck in the middle place. Yeah. I have two questions for you yes. before we move on, if you'd like. So uh -huh. the first one is, what fabric is the most commonly requested by customers, if any, and also the most durable? Um, well, I've sold thousands and thousands of yards of fabric, and um, I am going to say for a while I was having a run on faux wool for, for a long time, and I think that's because I had a lot of mid-century modern clients, and they just were loving um, a faux wool look, and then sometimes we've done real wool. A chenille is a very logical choice for families. It's soft, it's, um, it's washable. And speaking of washable, my favorite hands down long-term family friendly is uh, Romo product, Villanova. So Romo and Villanova and all, they're all part of the same fabric house. There's a, a product called Atlantis. And Atlantis um, has 400,000 double rubs. Is that just not insane? That's insane. That's insane. That's insane. Oh it, and it's completely washable. They have a whole great line of washables that have less than a 5% residual shrinkage. So I have gotten out, uh, accidentally got elevator grease on somebody's white couch. And believe me, I was hysterical. Dawn, a little bit of Dawn, got black elevator grease out of this white piece. And the big thing to, to look at some of these washable things is uh, there's a lot of washables coming on the market. And yes, they say technically that they're washable, but when you get in there and you start trying to wash it, what happens is that it leaves a fuzz mark. So you've gotten the stain out, but you now have a permanent Im impression of, of where it's been washed. So if you're sourcing, little tip, if you're sourcing a family friendly fabric, um, get some samples, put them through the ringer of whatever your client's sins are, mine, coffee, red wine, crayons, whatever, put it through what their life really looks like and then try to clean it and see what it looks like. Because I put Atlantis in a bar and all kinds of sins there, bubble gum and God only knows what else. And that was in 2000, um, gosh, how many years ago? I'm going to say it's probably five years ago, five years ago now, and it still looks great. Oh, I had to make sure I was. Oh, and it, it nets for um, $68 a yard, $68 worth every penny. They do have lower lower priced ones now. Oh, wait, no. The 68 is, so 118 retail. Yeah, so it's a little bit less. They have a lower line called Lucerne, and then they have Cambrai, which is a linen look. So they have two chenilles, and then a till is a washable velvet. So a little plug for Romo. Love Romo. For Romo. So everybody listening, that's great. <laughs> um, uh, just some nice comments. Someone said, I agree. I've, done, I've redone a piece from Ikea and gave their client uh, 15 years more with the frame. So... Yeah. That's pretty, um, I guess we're probably going to talk about that next, maybe dissecting um, how to know what good quality is. Sure. Shall we roll? Yeah, let's, let's roll. keep going. Let's keep, keep her moving. Okay, key quality elements. Look at my lovely graphic as we scroll past it. Okay, it all starts with the frame. Okay, so these are some of the, oops, sorry, I got fuzz, fuzz in my eyelashes. Um, it, it's, it's the foundation. Just like everything else, you build a house, you better have a good foundation. Um, a kiln dried, genuine hardwood frames are the foundation of an heirloom quality seat. Okay, so pine is, is soft. Um, anything with knot holes, that creates a weak joint. Um, poplar is used a lot because it's technically a hardwood, but it's not 
it, it, it's kind of the low end of hardwood. Um, you really want to have oak or maple frames because they're going to be consistent, tight grain, straight, you know, nice, they're gorgeous pieces of wood. Um, you want to have a coil spring construction, and I talk about coil spring a lot in why um, it's, it's important. It's because when you see these individual coils, they deflect and move individually. So they'll move front to back, side to side, corner to corner, um, with, with kind of a, an even flow. You'll never have any hard spots. Whereas with a sinuous spring construction, and sinuous spring you'll see in the photo, that's in the back. There's not a problem with it being necessarily in the back, but in the seat, uh, those are rated for about 200, 250 pounds. So if you have a client who's bigger, or heavier on furniture, my husband galumphs. He's, he's a galumpher, and he sits in one spot all the time. So we have a saggy spot in, in our couch, and our couch is a Drexel Heritage, and I bought it in 2007 before, before I knew, before I knew. Um, I bought it based on the brand name, not the, the quality construction of it. Um, so it has a saggy baggy spot, and um, there's just not much you can do about that. The spring front edge, I really want you to see that front edge that's coming around. Uh, the purpose of that spring front edge as it's lashed to the frame is that when you have a cushion sitting on the top of that, instead of going to a hard rail, it allows the cushion to compress and all the weight to deflect forward and really kind of elongates the front edge of your cushion so that you don't get that compression on the front end. And that, that's just for me, these are the hallmark qualities of, of, a, of a frame. Um, joints that are doweled, blocked, glued, and screwed with integral legs. When you have an integral leg that is part of your construction, it really helps to, to have the weight movement go from the top of your frame all the way down to the bottom. Say you're somebody who is a back sitter. You know, or you're having a party and somebody like me comes along and sits on the arm of your chair. So if you have kiln dried hardwood that is is all the way through the frame, you are less likely to break the frame, crack the frame, because, you know, you don't know if there's a knot hole sitting on that arm or on, on that back rail. You have no way of knowing because the fabric is covering it up. And if you are not looking at some of those um, hallmarks of quality, it's a crapshoot. So you can't easily fix those. You, you just can't. Um, the spring supported backs and cushion options vary with your style and, and preference for comfort. Um, this particular piece, I'm going to roll it down. This piece I love. This was probably my favorite piece we had go through the showroom. Loved it because it had everything that I love. First of all, it's kind of an Art Deco style. The frame on it is amazing. It has on the arms, it has springs on the arms, which is like, whoa, you know, go back to it has horse hair. It, it went back with horse hair and everything. So um, here is a picture of it finished and it's wearing a Ralph Lauren wool in a plaid, which, you know, that's totally my jam right there. But um, so that has a coil back, construction and it also had the Marshall units or the coil spring construction in the seat so you have lots of great weight deflection um, let's see what else and and anyone else who's in my in my classes what you'll see also on this is that the welt on this is an up the roll and we talk about this in the work order workroom it, when you're thinking ahead and you're going hmm does the welt always need to be on the bias not 100% always. It's a, it's a design feature that you make a decision of going ahead, you know, front end, because if you're working with a geometric or a plaid or a stripe and you put that on a true bias, it stretches your pattern all the heck and it creates a visual speed bump. So you factor that into your design aspect of it. Do I want that look? And if you don't want that look, then what are my options? Okay, so are we good? Yes. I have to unmute again. Okay. Um, okay. Found that extremely, no problem. Huh. Story of my life. <laughs> so I don't wear mascara often. I get things stuck in my eyes. Um, okay. So <laughs> not talking about my eyes. Um, I loved seeing the before and after. And I 
couple of nice comments in here too saying the same thing like seeing the transformation is pretty incredible um i have a question sure how is there a way to tell the coil construction without ripping off the fabric yes, ma'am. there is a way to tell could you Maybe elaborate wait. on how we do that okay so you will take your piece and very carefully, because you're going up into no man's land, you're gonna go on the underside, and the underside usually has what's called a dust cover or a cam of a, a, an interfacing type feeling um, fabric, and that just kind of holds everything in and, and keeps stuff from climbing up, and et cetera, et cetera. But if you feel in underneath there, and there's pressure pushing down, and there's webbing, because the, the webbing will lay and the springs will sit on top of it. And uh, the springs will kind of push down. So if you rub your hand in underneath, you'll be able to physically feel that. If you can't feel it, the next choice is to, and 99% of the time you're gonna feel it that way. But if you're scared to run your hand up in there, start with the decking. So that means lift your cushion up, Push your hand in between where the cushion and the body of the, the frame are and kind of press and feel and see if you can feel sinuous springs. Once you know what that feels like, then you're going to be able to identify it easier. But the, but the no-brainer way is to reach your hand up in. But always be careful with that because you don't know how they've clamped the springs. Sometimes they'll use metal clinch it clips and they'll be sharp. So. If you're going to do it, don't, you know, do this because you can come back with a rip. Yeah, that's really good. We don't want to rip or like, you know, cut yourself. No, no tetanus <laughs> shots today. No, let's just find beautiful furniture that needs a second life. Um, a question then on that, um, where do you find uh, vintage furniture? I find it all over the place. Um, so... I have people now calling me saying, will you take it? I love Savers. Savers is great. Um, uh, another place, bulky item pickup. It's free. It's totally free. And when you're restoring a piece, you are stripping it all the way down to the wood. And there's only, in, in all the pieces I've ever done, there's only been three, I think, where the frame was not um, salvageable. You know, we've had a couple of them that had mold on them and I just don't mess with mold that goes, that just goes away. I've had a couple that were um, cat urinated and that's rough to deal with, but it can be abated with bleach and shellac. You know, that was for a sentimental piece. Uh, probably had it not been a sentimental piece, they probably wouldn't have pursued restoring it. But um, for the most part, you know, don't pay, let, let's put another analogy in here because you guys, I love analogies. If you are looking to invest in or buy a house, and as a designer, you're looking at wanting to buy something, are you gonna go in and buy something somebody else has already flipped? Probably not, because you don't wanna spend money doing whatever it is that they did to spit polish the thing. So you don't have to buy any, you just get it free. These frames are plentiful, they are cheap. Um, I've picked up a few pieces off of the Facebook Marketplace and ironically enough, the, the pieces that are crap are a higher price than your great vintage pieces. The great vintage pieces, people are like, please just take it. So <laughs> that's sad. That's uh, right. Right. But that's because people, if you're not a designer, right, you don't. Right. If you don't know what to do with it. And, and that also is a reflection of the values of our society. Yeah, we could have a whole other webinar on that. Right. Knowing quality from upholstery, right. furniture, decor, all of it. Yeah. Um, I have another question for you. Um, do you keep used upholstery on hand and then wait for a customer to purchase a reupholstered piece? I used to do that. So when I started my, um, my business, which was, I'm, I'm sits and housed now, Years ago, I opened up uh, the workroom in a place called the West Bottoms here in Kansas City, and we were called Sit On It, a chair gallery. I had 10,000 square feet, and I had like lots and lots of frames that I had collected, um, and I would kind of clean them up a bit, you know, so they were palatable, 
and then I would price them for the labor because I would go through and I'd look and I go, okay, here's the labor cost. I know what needs to be done with it. Here's how many yards we're going to need to start. Um, you know, obviously you're going to need more if there's a pattern repeat, but here's the minimum yardage we need. So pick a frame you like, let's go to the design center, pick a fabric and all the work would be done in house. Um, when my lease ran out and we decided to move elsewhere, apparently sit on it is a trademark frame name. So I, I changed the name to sits in house because uh, it's still sit on it gallery. It's just German and my family and my husband are German. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. But um, we moved out of the West Bottoms because my mom got sick with, with black mold disease or, you know, black mold and, and had some issues and, we didn't want to renew our lease there. So that's going down another path, but that was a pivoting point. So I don't do that anymore now that my mom has retired. I don't keep that. Um, and the reason is that this it's plentiful to find, totally plentiful to find. Yeah, so it's not necessary to keep things in stock because you can get enough of it. But in the warehouse district, you know, where square footage was, you know, a dollar a square foot, it wasn't that big of a deal or less than a dollar square foot. It was, it was not a big deal to have all of those great pieces. But when you're going into a more of a retail lease scenario, it, it takes up a lot of real estate. Right. The real estate. You have to think about that so, from a bis business decision. Exactly. Ooh, we've um, got storms coming through Kansas city. Oh my goodness. It got dark all of a sudden. Uh oh. Um, okay. Do you want to keep going? Yep. Okay. Let's keep going. Okay. Okay, that's my mama. That's my mama. Um, working with your workroom. So your trades, everybody wants to do the best job for you the first time because you, you have to have the communication of what your expectations are. And that's what the workroom work order worksheet is all about is managing your expectations because you, you have a design idea, a design concept for what you want for your client space. You know, they may have one. The workroom work order helps put that into uh, easily um, ways to communicate what your expectations are. And then you hand that to your upholsterer or your trade. And that way, all these questions are answered straight up the first time. Uh, your project doesn't get pushed back because they can't get a hold of you because they got to ask, ask you a question. It's things that help keep your project moving on track, going forward, no delays, and no expensive mistakes because I have seen it happen, and I'm, I'm going to say I did it myself. I did it myself. Accidentally put the wrong fabric on the wrong chair. Now, you tell me who pays for that. Not only do you have to pay to strip it off, but you can't reuse the fabric. You have to buy the fabric again, and then you have to pay to put it back on. And um, if you are not communicating, not only did you just create a delay in your project pro uh, timeline, but you just lost every bit of the profit you had. So those are the kinds of things that you, you have to have on the front end to make sure that Everybody gets moving forward. Now your tradespeople, they are not sitting around twiddling their thumbs waiting for your next job. They are booked solid. They got stuff to do. Okay. They're super busy because it is, they're, they're not enough tradespeople around there, which brings me to my next one. The upholstery industry is currently in transition. We have a huge labor force of skilled trades that are ready to retire. They're on their last leg. We have lost some of our, our skills trade because a lot of people have gone to college and um, we just don't do things with our hands like we do used to. So what I'm excited about are some of the women that, that have gone back to learn upholstery as a trade and they are much more open to working with us as designers. They are excited to be creative. They love working with their hands and, and producing something of value. Um, a chicken, a chair, a funky, funky little chair upholstery, uh, um, Ragna um, Smith, I can't remember, Felix, Felix Hart. So there's a group core of women that are starting to really kind of, Rachel Fletcher, um, they're starting to get back in and get things moving and, and to get that. But, but there's a, a little bit of a gap between 
enough people and the crotchety old men that are always doing things their way. And we just have to present ourselves. So the biggest complaint that so many of the trades that I hear is, uh, they come in, they're all uppity. They, they act like they're all entitled. They show up. They don't, they, they want me to drop everything I'm doing to stop and pay attention to them for 20 times. So some of the workroom etiquette is how would you want to be treated in your business? Do you want people knocking on your door unannounced, wanting you to drop mid project? So make an appointment to see, make an appointment to go in and go over your workroom work order with them. Have a one-to-one -one conversation with them, ask questions because if you let your trade person know that I, I'm here to make this a, a positive working experience with you and um, I want, I want to, to build a relationship, a trusting relationship with you, um, then, then I think that, that people are a little more open to that. Um, don't ask for discounts. Okay, now this is one of the big, big things that's a real problem. Upholsters seem to think we make a lot of money and we don't. They make more money than we do, but that also doesn't mean that it's a huge amount of profit margin. They are working their butts off. So when we come at an upholstery or a trade workroom and we're saying, hey, we've got our own fabric, I'm gonna bring my own fabric, immediately the first thing that they hear is, oh, well you just cut out one of my revenue streams because they have fabrics doesn't mean they have the fabric that your client is gonna want, okay? So, but that's the first first thing they go, hmm, you, you just cut out my, my revenue. And then they go, oh, well, I'm a designer. Can I, can I get a trade discount? Unless you have a long-term relationship with them, just like your tile layer, just like your general contractor, your chances of getting a discount are slim to nil. So don't even ask until you have a, a good, relationship with them they are not charging enough for their labor and that's just that's just a thing they are not charging enough for their skill set it takes it takes 20 years to learn this skill not five I mean granted there are some very skilled people at the five-year mark um, but if you have a restoration piece they earn every single penny of that so does that make sense yes Okay. 100%. Um, I have a couple. Questions. I'm very protective of, of my posters. I'm extremely because I see how hard they work. I, I think that's great. You should. Um, you, the people that do the great work for you got to respect them, right? You can't do it yourself, and they're delivering something exceptional to your clients. You, your partnership, right? You should have partnership together. Yeah. Without yeah. them, you wouldn't be delivering an excellent, beautiful product to your client, right? Yeah. So. Right. Right. And and with the workroom work order, your your upholsterer or your trade room, they're going to have their own workroom work order because they have their own system. Um, but it just provides a checklist of all the things to go down to make sure that you've communicated. Like, what kind of flow match are you expecting for this? What kind of, how do you want the welts? And if your vision, like that other chair, is that, that it's, if you don't come have a conversation and say to them, Oh, I don't want it on the bias and it comes out on the bias and you're like, ah, ah, you know, that is not what I had in mind. It's done. You know, it's done. So these are the kinds of things to think about on the front end. And that's what we talk about in the, in the work order. Are we good? Yep. Um, one question for you though. So um, Barbara says, my biggest problem is I'm in a small town and everyone knows the upholsterer. So clients just shop me and then go directly to the upholsterer. What to do? Well, what do you, can Barbara, can you put in there, what do you mean shop? That, that just means that you're not going to be able to up, up charge much. You can charge for your time. And what does charging your time look like? That means that uh, you charge the hour, hour and a half that it takes for you to work with, with them. And you just say, look, I am project managing your project. And chances are, if it's just the one single upholstery shop in there, that upholsterer is too busy to work with that client's nonsense. So, yeah, um, and, and have some sort of, uh, they will show up at the door unannounced and they'll wanna see. And, and it takes a lot of time away. 
bag. It really does. So Barbara, your opportunity when you're working with an upholstery studio is you, you, it, you're straight time and you, they buy the fabric through you. That's just period, end of discussion. Good advice. And she says, ah, oh, yes, that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Um, how many? Start? Yeah, I think we, and we got about uh, five, ten minutes okay. or so. Somewhere in there. Oh, here we go. Awesome. Okay, so you guys, I thank you all for coming. So here's what I have for you for, for freebies. I am a MyDoma user. I have been for about a year. So this is a special just for you guys because I love MyDoma. Um, I have 10% off for the Construction First and then the Details course, which is on Teachables. Um, and that's going to be for the next 24 hours. So make sure it's all caps slash MyDoma. Um, I have a printable that I think that uh, Sarah's going to send out, and that is the Yardage uh, Calculator with Pattern Repeat Guide. The really important thing about, about this uh, PDF that's a printable is that it's meant as a guide. You'll always want to go with the exact amount of yardage that your upholsterer wants. Um, but if you're working on a Saturday night or something and, and you're seeing a client and they're asking you, hey, I, what do you think it's going to cost? Instead of going, hmm, well, let me wait until to back with you. It gives you a, a dartboard. It's not going to be a bullseye, but it's going to be a, on a dartboard to let your client know where they are, if it's even within your budget. If you have to tell them, I have no idea, I can't tell you, I have no idea, you're gonna lose the sale. So it's just a way to kind of look at it and say, let me look at my printable PDF. This sofa's gonna need about 10 yards of fabric. The fabric I'm sourcing for you is $100 a yard. We know you're looking at $1,000 for fabric. I can't, and then you say, I can't tell you exactly how much the labor is. Let me work with my trade, but here's a roundabout figure that I know that we can guesstimate. Cheat sheets are the best. Cheat and there's a comment that came in earlier from Tanya saying that you're the guru of upholstery and couldn't agree more. You have, I use this term a lot, but you really are a fountain of knowledge. So this has been so informative and it seems like every comment that's coming through is, this is great. She's the best. It's so oh, amazing webinar. Can I just say, I was really stressed about doing this, like frantic, because I, I, I know a lot about fabric and upholstery, but putting together everything else that it takes to run a business, it, this is a, a steep learning curve. And I'm sure a lot of other designers are having that as, as, a, as a struggling point too, you know, like Canva. This was made in Canva. You can't just put it in there. It, it, it's a lot of the uh, trying to get everything together. So well, you did a fantastic job. And um, just based on the feedback and the comments coming in, another one, great presentation, lots of information. The, cal the calculator sounds good. Um, I think you. Oh, and then the ebook. I wanted to mention oh, yes. about, about that ebook. Okay, so here's, here's how the ebook. E works is that um, it's living in the teachables. So you'll go to rochelle.sitsonhouse.com and it's not www, it's, it's H-T-T-P-S uh, and then just go straight that. It'll take you to my teachable site. And um, as soon as I get off here, I'm gonna go and make all of that visible for the next 24 hours also. So you'll have a chance to read my little synopsis of um, what if we chose upholstery, uh, what if we chose our spouses the way we chose choose upholstery? That was a tongue twister. But I'm going to go make that visible for the next 24 hours along with the 10% uh, off for the bundled package. You are just too sweet. So guys, this is 24 hours, 10% off the full course. If you don't get the course, you also get the opportunity to read the book which is really great. And also the cheat sheet, uh, which right. we'll email out. You're just so full of love and sharing. And um, I hope that many of you take the opportunity to consider her course because it just is filled with great knowledge that, you know, clearly a lot of us missed it in school. So yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, um, Rochelle, can you just repeat the web address? For okay. The course. It will be. Oh, sorry, I interrupted you. We'll email this out as well, everybody. 
just so you know. So you'll get copies of the webinar and um, where to go get this information. But. Right. Um, so it's HTTPS colon slash slash Rochelle, R-I-C-H-E-L-L-E -E dot Sitzenhouse, S-I-T-Z-E-N-H-A-U-S dot com. I know that's complicated. And it'll take you straight to my um, online course, which is on the Teachables platform. If you are already on the Teachables platform, because I know a lot of, of educators have that as a, as a platform, you ought to be able to search uh, the Upholstery Academy within there. Also, it's going to be on my Facebook. So if any of you um, want to check out my, my Facebook pages, my personal pages, um, I'm sure there's some links on there too. That's perfect. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I guess we're pretty much at the end now. So if there are any more burning questions, throw them in the chat now. Otherwise, um, I guess we can probably wrap up. Uh, Rochelle, thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge. Um, and perhaps we'll do another one of these in the future. I think we could probably do some more if you'd be up for it. Oh, absolutely. We should do one on just vintage. How to, how to determine if it's worth it. Well, if my camera were on right now, you'd see my face lighting up because I'm a vintage lover. So um, I vote for that one. But what we do is run uh, maybe a, um, a poll over in the group and mm -hmm. get some feedback and just say, you know, what else do you guys want to learn? So um, thank you again. And to all of our viewers, you will, um, and anybody who couldn't attend today but did sign up, you will also receive a copy of everything. So stay tuned. All righty. Okay, thank you very much. We'll just stop this now.